Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Com 5 to 6. Uh, to get started, we have a full pack program for today. I want to finish uh, the text indexing unit. So I brought up um, a question we had yesterday already about the suffix um, about the suffix array, the inverse suffix array, and uh, how they relate. So just to get everyone uh, back on topic and focused, and then we'll get started right away. Um, in terms of announcements, I think nothing has really changed from yesterday. Uh, I expect to, uh, I expect you to join the tutorials today with Ben. As usual, remember you'll discuss the uh, sheet four again. Um, I will later today release the sheet six that covers material for unit six that we're currently talking about, and you will discuss that next week then. Um, after you have the all the class tests out of the way for this week, and then uh, you also have some extra time for working on the bamboo question. We extended the deadline till next Friday, and uh, I will have some pleasant time watching all your videos. All right, with that, I think we're good to go. Um, as always, please use Campus Wire. Please use the back channel, the lecture back channel, if any, anything um, is not as it should be. And uh, also use the, the Q&A if, if anything is unclear during the lecture. Okay, well, we're here. Um, here are the votes so far. And uh, I'll just show you the correct answers again. Um, this is not a question we had yesterday. Um, sorry, I was mistaken. So maybe sp let's uh, spend a minute to discuss the results. Um, I'll leave the question open. I want to make an announcement about yesterday first, and then we'll uh, come back to this question. Um, announcement number one is I fixed the slides for uh, this example. So in the in the lecture notes, you will see that I uh, uh, fixed the the order of R and by and a couple of other things where it didn't advance exactly in the way it should. Um, more importantly, I want to point out that this this method fat pivot radix quicksort for sorting strings. Um, it's a good method in the usual case, uh, but it does depend on the type of strings. Um, this precise statement that's made here, that's from, from the book uh, from Sedgwick and Wayne, uh, that relies on an assumption about the strings. In that case, it's random strings where every character is, is randomly chosen from the allowable set of characters. Um, if that is violated, um, this is not true. And in particular, if if you apply it for suffix sorting and uh, take a text that is just all A's, I mean, we will have this dollar at the end, but that doesn't really make a big difference. You can think about how this method would work. It's maybe instructive to do this yourself. Uh, but this is a really bad case in which, uh, in which you don't get this uh, running time. So this is a word of caution. This method does work fairly well for the usual type of texts because they don't have to have the tend to have this degenerate uh, characteristics. Um, but it's it's not true. Um, I may may have given this impression yesterday that it always works in the worst case in, in, in log n time. This is not the case, even if you randomize the pivots. So I uh, wanted to emphasize this again. Which um, also means it's even more important that we learn a method that has guaranteed performance for uh, computing or sorting suffixes of a given string. Um, I'll come back to this picture probably again. Remember uh, my mnemonics for the suffix array L was it's the leaf array, leaves of the suffix array in sorted order, uh, left to right for this for you this way. 
So it's, it stands for leaf. It also stands for left because in this picture we can go from the right to the left. Uh, if we have the, the suffixes in sorted order, we can get the position in text order or the starting position of the suffix, same thing. And the inverse suffix array was going in the opposite direction. You have a uh, position in the text and you want to know the rank, the position in the sorted list. And that's um, where this question gets at. Um, let me f now first jump to this question that I post you. And well, you can see what you voted on the right. Um, as I said, L lists the leaves of T in left to right order. That's where L comes from leaves. And um, so uh, this is not true by, about R. Even if you swap right to left, that wouldn't be very useful, as most of you noticed. Um, also, uh, this statement is also true about L. It lists the starting indices of suffixes in the lexicographic order. If you sort all the suffixes, then L gives you the starting index uh, of the so-and-so uh, suffix. Uh, this was exactly the definition of the two things that um, maybe you have to refresh uh, about this. Um, it's a couple of slides back. I'll show it in a second again. And uh, well, these mnemonics, uh, there's no right or wrong maybe for these, uh, but I do think they are helpful. So uh, maybe uh, stress that the fifth time today. L stands for leaf and for left, going left in this, <laughs> going left in this picture. And R stands for rank or going right in the picture. It's mirrored for me, so it's confusing. Let me jump back a couple of pages and show one more time, the important picture. I think this is what you should keep in mind. This, the suffix is in text order on the left, the suffix is in sorted order on the right, and then you can go to the right, go to the left. That's what the suffix array and inverse suffix array do for you. All right. With that, uh, I think we're all caught up and can move on. What we were discussing yesterday was a linear time, worst case linear time algorithm for sorting the suffixes of a text. And this was the overview, the DC3 algorithm. It had three steps. First, we do a recursive call on roughly two thirds of the suffixes. We'll come back to that. Uh, what we get from the recursive call is the ranks of all the, suffix, the, of all the suffixes that do not start at a multiple of three. So that was this, uh, this notation used here. And um, what we use this for is to induce, without spending a lot of time, the ranks for R3. That's what we've seen. And uh, the third step is what we still have to discuss. And we've also seen, uh, given that these two steps take linear time, the entire method takes linear time. Because in the recursive call, we always get rid of a constant fraction. And so that gives rise to a geometric sum. Uh, how did we do the um, inducing the ranks from R12 to uh, the suffixes that start at a multiple of three? It's basically summarized in, in this picture. Uh, so we have the suffixes here. Um, these are the ones that we don't know how to sort yet. These are the ones that we have sorted recursively, so we know their ranks. Now there's uh, two key ingredients to uh, doing this. First one is we can chop off the first character in, in these suffixes here. And once we do that, we get a suffix from the other list, from this list that we already know how to sort. And that will help us to sort these by, that's what we mean by inducing. We can induce the relative ordering of two suffixes from the unknown set using the ranks from the known set. The second key ingredient for this step is that we can sort in linear time a set of integers uh, that is bounded in range. So if we have n integers and there are numbers uh, of the size order n, or maybe even the numbers 1 to n, um, then we can do this in linear time. 
you remember unit three counting sword we discussed this in detail actually and there was a little red box where at the time i said memorize this we'll come back to it this is the point where we do come back to it all right that was uh step one uh, step two now um Where we left off yesterday was the second step of the DC3 algorithm, where we induced the relative order of the suffixes that start at a multiple of three from the ranks that we recursively computed, namely those blue ones, the suffixes that don't start at a multiple of three. What is left to do is merging these two things. We have a sorted list of suffixes all of those that start at multiple of three, and we have a sorted list of all those that start at other positions. Um, and I showed these here in, in green and blue. And uh, so these are sorted lists of strings, and we would like to merge them. And uh, the approach will be to use the standard merge sort merge method. So we start at the beginning. Um, the first overall suffix must be one of the first of these two. So we have to compare them. And then the smaller of the two gets output and we move to the next one. So in this case, the first one will be this dollar sign because we always assume uh, if nothing comes, then this is sorted before anything that has another character. So um, I've done this with a few of the first uh, suffixes to show how we get, uh, get going in the, in the general case. So here you see these are alphabetically sorted, and I stopped at a certain point, namely um, at these two. So the next step, we know these, uh, we have the first green, two green ones and the first three blue ones. These are the next two suffixes that we have to compare. Now we'd like to know which one is, is earlier in the alphabet. We could just compare them uh, char character by character, but that's too slow. We only have a constant time in our, uh, in our performance budget. So we have to do this really, really quick. Now we've already seen a trick just, uh, bef just yesterday in step two, how we can sometimes do this comparison very quickly by chopping off the first character. So let's try the same trick. Here's our green string. If we take the first character off, we are guaranteed to land in the blue set. Um, and uh, we also know which of the suffixes that is, because it's exactly the one that starts one character later. So that's easy. We can do the same thing with the blue string. We chop the first character off, and then, uh, oops, we're ending up in the green set again. So we know which, which one it is, but we are still comparing one green and one blue, an apple and an orange. So we still don't know which of the two is uh, comes earlier in the alphabet without uh, spending more effort. So it seems not to work in this case. Um, but uh, don't you worry, it is just another step that we need to make, and then it always works. And that is uh, just because of the fact that we uh, have every third in this list. Um, so you occasionally get this case that chopping off one character, you're still both in different sets, but if you then do it another step, so, um, right, what you do is, um, you take one character off and you do this with another one that is positioned somewhere, somewhere else. Um, I wanted to make this a little longer. So here, here are two suffixes. Uh, so sorry, the, should really stop at the same point. And you're trying to get them both into the greens, in the, into the blue set. And uh, the blue set has uh, two out of three positions. Maybe these two, and then there's one green one. So here's one green position, two blue positions. Every position is either green or blue. And now, uh, of course, these are colored in the same way. Now, originally, this one starts green, this one starts blue, so they're in, in different uh, in different in different 
classes. If you chop off the first character here, they're still uh, in different classes, now opposite. But if you also chop off this character, you're guaranteed that they're both in the, in the blue set. And uh, you can think about this, you either, always have one of the two cases. Either you have to chop off one character and they're both in the blue set, or you have to chop off two characters and then they're both in the blue set. Um, but uh, it always is just at most two characters that you have to take away from these strings. And then you end up in a, in a situation where you have two blue ranks, two blue suffixes whose ranks you know, so you can compare them. Okay? That's an important, um, that's the key step for the merging. So um, let me know if, uh, if this step uh, is clear now. Uh, if you have questions, as always, put them in the Q&A. So uh, we need just um, constant time for this comparison because what we do is we, instead of originally comparing two suffixes, we now compare one or two uh, pairs of letters, chopping off the first characters. Only if they are equal, we have to continue. And uh, in the worst case, we have to find the first two characters of the two suffixes are the same, the second characters are the same, and then what remains is two blue suffixes. So we look up using R their rank, and we compare the ranks as numbers, and then we know the outcome of the comparison. It cannot come out equal, that's because we have the end of word marker. So we will always find in at most three steps which of the two is uh, smaller and then uh, we can we can put this next one, uh, which is it in this, in this case, 17 and 13. So 17's here, 13's here. So 13 would be the one. So the green one should be the next one that comes here, um, which sounds wrong. No, it's the other one. The 11 is this one. So the, uh, the blue one is the next one, of course. So the next entry here would be T11, uh, copying whatever that string is. That way we can get in constant time the next entry. So we produce the sorted list of suffixes in constant time. And that concludes how to do the overall third step of the DC3 algorithm in constant time, in linear time. Okay. This is almost it. Unfortunately, there's um, one or two uh, caveats with this. So we've shown that both the inducing the ranks for R3 is linear time and the merging is linear time. But uh, if you look closely, we actually cheated in the step one. I simply said uh, step one was recursively sort the suffixes that uh, start at different at positions, not a multiple of three. Uh, compute this R12 recursively. But it's not really a, an instance of the same problem because uh, to call this recursively, we would need a single string so that these are the suffixes of this string. That's the problem that we are solving with the main algorithm. That's the problem that we can recurse on. But what we now have is a weird set of strings. It's uh, well, two out of every three suffixes of a given string. How can we even apply the method to this? Uh, for that, we have to look a little closer. It seems that this doesn't really um, doesn't really make doesn't really work. But you can make it work with um, a trick. Uh, I'll move out of the way for the example in a second. But let me first discuss this. The key insight is we don't directly use the same text. We modify the text in, in two ways. First of all, we don't consider the original alphabet, but we make uh, new uh, compound ca characters that each consist of three of the original characters. And I'll denote these by these little boxes. Now, um, if you take, so this is where the example is important. Here's our original text, banana ban, and we fill up with dollars uh, as convenient. And then I'll denote with T box the boxed string where you uh, just take triples um, and uh, make one character out of these. If you take the suffixes of this T boxed, then these are exactly the original subs uh, the original um, 
suffixes that start at a multiple of three. Because uh, the suffixes of this thing, they start with everything, and then the next thing leaves out the, thir the thir first thir three characters. Ah. The first three characters, the first six characters omitted, and so on. Okay. So I hope this, that's the, um, that's the easy part. Uh, we can emulate this skipping suffixes by grouping characters together and making these boxes around them. So instead of uh, the alphabet B, A, N, and dollar, we now have the alphabet of Ban, of Anna, of another Ban, of triple dollar, and all the other triples that might occur in your text. So this would be fine for recursing on all those. We want to recurse on all others. So you have to apply uh, a slight additional trick. Um, and the trick is, is this. Instead of the original text, you, you uh, generate this weird text um, where you start, you take the suffix of t where you start at the first position and take the box version of that. So that would give you t1 and t4 and uh, t7 uh, and so on. All the ones that are 1 modulo 3. And then you append another copy of t where you start with the second character. So from this you get t2, t5, t8 and so on. And uh, you insert dollar triples in the middle so that you can uh, you can separate those two. Okay, so uh, that means um, even though so suffixes of this text they're either starting with something here or they're starting something with here, and there will always be a dollar so that uh, for those one that start here they have this long tail of the entire copy of the text, but we can ignore that because we know. Once we see the dollar, we can actually stop comparing. Okay, so we recursively compute the suffix array, uh, the inverse suffix array, rank array, and leaf array on this t prime. And uh, if you check the math works out, we took two copies of t, but we grouped um, triples of characters. So that still has roughly two third n characters now. So it's the same. Uh, reduction in the input size and now uh, the problem fits the, or the original description and we can recursively call the very same algorithm on this. That's brilliant. Now because of this fix we actually created a new problem and uh, to illustrate the problem you have to really look carefully. So this is something that's very easy to overlook when you first think about it. So this, this seems to work fine, right? Um, we know how to do step two and step three, and we know how to do step one, and we have reduced it in a way to compute suffix and rank and leaf array on another string. So why, where should there be a problem in this? Um, maybe you can think about it and uh, throw it in the, in the Q&A. Uh, this would be a good time to pause the video if you're watching this offline. Um, but because we have some um, some more material for today on on the list, uh, I want to go on and uh, just tell you what happens. So what obviously happens because we take triples is that our alphabet cubes in every recursive call. Right? We uh, we start with sigma characters. That's the original string, and that can be any number, but you can assume that sigma is at most n because uh, it doesn't make much sense to have an, an alphabet with more characters than ever occur in your text. Uh, you could always um, reduce that to the characters that are only the characters that occur in your text. But then in the first recursive call, we make triples out of that, and they're sigma cubed triples of three letters from this from this alphabet. The next recursive call, uh, we would take sigma cubed and cube that again that's sigma to the nine and you keep doing this so even if if originally sigma was two just a binary alphabet after 10 steps you have a thousand uh sorry cubed so whatever that is uh what's 
two to the 30, that's already um, in the billions. That's almost uh, the capacity of an int, and that's 4 billion. So it's, it's roughly a billion. So that's already really bad. And that's just 10 recursive calls. You will need, um, you'll need a few more if your text is long. So this will completely explode. Your alphabet will be big. Now, that is not by itself a problem, but we relied implicitly on this linear time sorting. Let me just briefly go back to that step to make this very clear. We rely on linear size alphabets in this, in this step. We uh, induce the ranks in step two from the ranks that we recursively compute by replacing the long suffixes by these pairs a character and the rank from the, the remaining suffix. The rank is fine. That's always a number between, uh, I don't know, 0 and n. But the first here is one character from our, al from our alphabet. And if the alphabet explodes, becomes bigger and bigger, then this becomes much longer. And we cannot do this, this linear time sorting anymore, because that only works if we're sorting something where the range is roughly as big as the list we're sorting. OK, I hope the problem is clear now. So this is, this is the problem. What's the solution for this? The solution is to observe that, yes, the alphabet can become very big, but there's no way we can use all these different triples in each step. Remember, our t prime, the text that we recurse on, it only has two third n different characters. That's the length of this text. So that can be at most that many different triples that are actually occurring in our text. So what we do is an alphabet reduction, a step where we replace the actual triples by a number or by a different alphabet if you want, but it's convenient to think of these as numbers. So what we do is we take all the triples that actually occur, make a list of these, and then we sort them. This can be done in linear time because in the initial step, sigma is, is say a constant or even bounded by n, it's order n. So we have triples of numbers that are each from uh, order n, so three steps Radix sort with three steps or three rounds of counting sort, same thing, uh, can sort any list of such triples. That can be done in linear time. And then we have a sorted list of these triples and we replace every triple by its rank. I'll have an example on the next slide. So that um, ensures that in all recursive calls, we always have an alphabet that's at most as big as the text is long. That's always sufficient. It always makes sense. But we need this extra step because we computed uh, the text um, over a very large alphabet. So we have to do this alphabet reduction step in between. So as promised, um, here's an example for that. Um, here's our um, the, my favorite um, example from, from this subsection where we need a bit longer text, Hannah Ben's Bananas Man. And uh, so here's the t prime. Here you see t1, it omits the first character. t2 omits the first two characters. And uh, then you just, um, well, you fill up with dollars here uh, in the text uh, whenever you need it. So you just uh, fill that up with dollars so that it aligns with um, multiples of three. That's easy to do if you actually compute the, the triples. So here's t prime, how it actually looks. Uh, it has lots of these triples, but that's way fewer than what's the alphabet size? We have h, a, n, b, s, m. So maybe six, six different characters, if I can count. Uh, six to the power of three is already, uh, I don't know, <laughs> a big number. Um, something like almost uh, 200. There's definitely not 200 different triples that occur here. 
the occurring triples are actually these. So this Anna, that's um, occurring twice, and the, the dollar, that's occurring twice. Um, there's not many duplicates here, but there's many triples that don't occur here, like triple S or triple N or whatever. Right. Then you sort those triples that occur, three rounds of counting sort. Then you get the ranks of these. And uh, finally, you take every triple and replace it by its rank. So just do this in slow-mo. If you have the triple A and N, you find that in the list. And um, the way to do this is um, you probably want to do some, some hashing trick in, in this uh, to, to implement this mapping efficiently. But let's, um, let's omit that detail. So suppose you have a way to quickly find, we didn't talk about hashing in this module. Um, suppose you have a, an efficient way to find, oh, we could just use a try, um, a depth three try. OK, you insert all these into a try and store the rank there. So in constant time, because it's just depth three, uh, you can find this. Um, and so you replace this by its rank three. Let's do another example. A, H, B in the sorted list is here. So you replace it by its rank, etc. You will also notice that the triple dollar necessarily is the first character in the new alphabet because it comes before all the other triples. So this will always get a rank of zero. And so we'll, we'll serve the role of a new um, dollar character in the reduction. OK, that's how you get the, the T double prime, which is the actual string that you do the recursive call on. Uh, where you can say the alphabet is, is bounded in size in the length of the string. But that is, that is really it. That's uh, all there is to the DC3 algorithm. So the steps are, first, you do the recursive call. For this, you construct T prime as shown here. Then you sort the triples and reduce them to the rank. That gives you T double prime. On that, you really recurse. When you come back, you have computed the R12, the ranks of all the suffixes of, of this string, which can be mapped back to the suffixes of T that start at not the multiples of three positions. From that, you induce the ranks of all the suffixes that start at multiples of three. And then you do the merging step. And both uh, step two and step three, again, use the tricks I've shown before to run in linear time. That's how you construct a suffix array in linear time, no matter how big the alphabet, no matter what the string looks like. Uh, this is worst case, always works. Um, the algorithm is a bit complicated because of the different steps you have to combine, but each of the individual steps is not very hard to do. And uh, you can implement this in, in fairly concise code also. Um, the, the paper that presented this algorithm has a, a, an implementation in the paper that fits in the appendix. So this is fairly efficient in practice and close to the methods uh, that are used. There are further tweaks to make it slightly more efficient, but that's, um, that's the core method that's behind these. So that brings me to the end of the suffix array section. We've seen that uh, compared with the suffix tree that has all these pointers and the worries how to represent a try in memory, etc., in a, in a memory efficient way, the suffix array is just an array of numbers, and that's very easy uh, to work with. Um, and uh, space efficient as well. It's very simple to construct it um, on random strings. I just want to add this here again. So this is this is the the fat pivot radix quick sort, which is working very well if you just apply it to usual text. But um, the guarantee is is much weaker than this in the worst case. But we've also seen we can do it in optimal linear time, up to a constant factor at the same time as you need to read the text. And uh, unlike for the suffix tree algorithms that were known before that. This is actually with a reasonable constant. You can do this on, on really large strings. And the suffix array in isolation is already enough to support efficient string matching. We've seen that at the very beginning. You have a sorted list of strings, so you just use binary search. That is already pretty good. You can speed up that search a little bit. That's something we didn't talk about, but um, 
we'll we'll get to something that's better than this anyway. So a slight slight downside in the in the pure form, like I've shown I've shown it. String matching takes m times log n, not the optimal order m time. Uh, but even if the text is very big, log n is not unreasonable. Um, the more the more important downside is as it stands. Um, the suffix tree had all these applications. Remember, I listed six application, and Gusfield's book has over twenty. Uh, and um, the simplest one might have been string matching or, or pattern matching, um, but uh, there's many others. And it seems for those we can't easily use suffix arrays. So there's still uh, something to add to make them as versatile and powerful as suffix trees, and that's what we will actually look. At next. Um, I think it's a good idea to take a tiny break now as opposed to in the middle of the section then. Um, I don't know how you are in terms of steam. Maybe you don't really need the break. Maybe we can have uh, some feedback on the back channel. Do you feel we should have the break now or rather delay it a little bit? Even if that means it's more in the middle of the of the next section. Probably should have made it a proper poll. Let's do the uh, the default is We, uh, I keep just chatting for a minute and that we call that a break. <laughs> okay, some feedback that people still have enough focus to go on. Does anyone want to contradict Franco? It's not so many people have, who are signed into the lecture back channel as, at least judging from the red notifications. <clears throat> Maybe this is a good point to emphasize that this is a useful tool to direct me a little bit. <clears throat> all right, if no one wants to contradict, then let's simply pretend we all are full of energy and want to continue. And I'll try to find a, a proper place for a break if we need it uh, later in the in the section. In the next subsection, I want to talk about the LCP array, the longest common prefix array. That will be an addition to the suffix array that allows us to solve many more of the problems that we could attack with the suffix tree, but now using just the suffix array. So what is the LCP array? To get you a little bit back um, awake and in shape, let's think about one of the applications, namely um, the length of the longest repeated substring. That was, remember, that was the single string version of the problem that Knuth conjectured would not be possible to solve in linear time. And it also was, uh, the first problem where we've seen that suffix trees can do this easily. Now I'm asking you what exactly was the feature of uh, suffix trees that we used for this? Um, I think all of these features that I listed here are actual features of suffix trees. So suffix trees can do all of these and there's algorithms that make use of that. Um, but uh, specifically for this problem to find the longest repeated substring, there's, um, there's really one of them that uh, is very important um, for finding the longest repeated substring. Without that feature, you don't get anywhere close. Um, the actual algorithm might implicitly rely on some of the others. So uh, it's probably hard to say that any of these is completely irrelevant. 
uh, but uh, there's there's definitely one feature that I would say is is the key feature for this problem. Okay, let's see what we have. Um, I love to get the the usual twenty five people voting, so maybe we can spend them um, another minute on this. But I do want to move on also uh, to show you the construction algorithm of this. So maybe let's um, show the results here now. Also because most of the people uh, got the most important thing, right? So I marked the other answers as not correct. But uh, the truth is that um, the algorithm probably uses some of the others as well. The traversal probably needs the constant time traversal to child or parent nodes. Um, we don't really use the order of leaves, to be fair, to be honest. We don't really use the jumping to the leftmost leaf in, in the subtree. Uh, but the, the key thing is that we know the string depth of internal nodes, because remember, every internal node is something shared between at least two suffixes. Shared between, between at least two suffixes means it's a repeated substring, the path to that node, and the string depth is the length of that uh, string on the path from the root to that node. So that is precisely what we need for finding repeated substrings, and then the maximal string depth of any internal node is the longest repeated substring. Right, so that's, that's, that was that. Um, how can we possibly add this back to the suffix array? Internal nodes is inherently something in the tree structure of the suffix tree, and that is completely lost by simply looking at the order of leaves, right? I even said the order of leaves is exactly something in the suffix tree that we did not use for this problem. So how can we, how can we add this back? Remember the algorithm for uh, finding the longest repeated substring was like this. We compute the string depth of all nodes, and then we find one node, one internal node with maximal uh, string depth. So again, let's briefly do this here. String depth 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2. So the maximal ones are these two. And uh, here you see there's two maximal repeated substrings in banana ban. It's ban, occurring ban ban here and there, and ana, which occurs here and here in an overlapping way. But that's uh, in general um, okay for repeated substrings. It seems unclear how to do this in a suffix array by itself. But if we add another piece of information, we can actually do it. And uh, that is the LCP array, which is um, an array of numbers again. So that's similar to the suffix array. And that's similarly as before an advantage for implementing it. It doesn't have an entry for zero. That's just a, a technicality I want to point out. Usually, I let all our arrays start at zero, as is convention in most programming languages. Uh, but for the LCP array, it's uh, convenient not to do this. The rth entry in the LCP array is the longest, the length of the longest common prefix of two suffixes, namely two that are neighboring in the sorted order, or neighboring leaves in the suffix tree, namely those that start at position r and uh, whatever is. Uh, the uh, the next one. So the the rth suffix in sorted array in the sorted order and the, the previous one. That explains why there's no entry for zero, because there's no previous entry for zero. So um, yeah, let me um, okay, we'll we'll see the example on the next slide in, in full detail. So maybe that's that's enough. I just want to point out that uh, between any two neighboring leaves, so these are Remember, left to right, the leaves, this gives you the suffix array. If you just walk around the tree in this, in this manner, the suffix array of this, of this string anaban will be 9, 5, 7, 3, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's uh, what we used before. Now, between any two, we will have this LCP array. So the LCP array will correspond to the um, point between, it will always be something between two, uh, two adjacent um, 
leaves. And if we take, for example, the seven and the three, this point corresponds to this node, the lowest common ancestor of these two um, leaves. And you'll see the LCP array stores essentially the string depth of this node. That's the connection to string depths and to finding longest repeated substrings. Um, but we'll go over the example in full detail here. Let's make the, the full connection. Here's the suffix array, and it will be the same example. So remember, I promised it's 95731, etc. 95731, etc. So that matches up. That's the, the suffix array. These are the suffixes in sorted order. We can find the longest common prefix between those. So I read that, I wrote that in between. These overlap in terms of A. These have AN in common. These have ANA in common, etc. So these are exactly the labels of paths to internal nodes. That's no coincidence. Uh, every internal node in a tree is the lowest common ancestor of two adjacent leaves. You can think about why that is true, but that's that's always the case in a in a in a compacted tree. So here we have again the suffixes in sorted order and their um, LCP values. Uh, these are the strings, and the LCP array stores the length of this shared prefix. Okay, uh, that's all there is to it. Now, um, so far. This is, this is just the definition. It's very elementary, very, very simple. You can sort all the suffixes, then you get the, the suffix array. You can compare uh, how much do they overlap, then you get the LCP array. I've already hinted at a, com at a connection to suffix trees, but you can actually make this very explicit. And in a sense, these two arrays contain all the information about the suffix tree. And that's really cool because that will mean those two together will allow us to compute the suffix tree. But we don't really want, we don't really have to do that. We can actually live with those two uh, alone, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's see how this connection works. Um, there's a notion of LCP intervals. That is the range of uh, the, the suffixes in sorted order that share a common prefix. And because they're uh, sorted alphabetically, these are always um, intervals. So there's a, well, a, a trivial one with the empty string. Every, every string has the empty string as a, as a prefix, so that's saying nothing. But we need a root for our tree, and the root corresponds to sharing at least nothing. Then there's a bunch of strings that start with an A, and these are all grouped together. These are these four strings. That's an LCP interval of three because the uh, common, the shared prefix is always uh, between these. So um, the length three here actually means four, um, four suffixes. Then there's a smaller interval of those that share a n. These are these three, a n, a n, a n. And there's an even smaller one that share ana, ana, that's only these, these two suffixes then. Uh, things can be degenerate, as in this case, um, there's only two that have a start with a B, the same two start with BA and actually ban. So there's only this interval corresponding to this, this entire thing. Uh, and that, that will be an indication that there's um, an edge with a longer string label. So to make that connection complete, here's the suffix tree again drawn sideways. And you can make a one-to-one -one connection between the internal nodes of the suffix tree and the LCP intervals. And um, these intervals are well nested. Uh, so whenever you have a, a smaller subinterval, it's completely contained in the parent interval. That's exactly as a subtree um, subtrees are contained in the subtree of the parent, etc. So this is a, a perfect mapping, and it means that all the information of the suffix tree is entirely contained in the suffix array and the LCP array. Okay, that's a really cool picture to keep in mind. 
because it means we can entirely, at least for implementing it, we can entirely do away with the suffix tree and only concentrate on these two arrays, which are much easier to, uh, to store and to handle in code. But we effectively have the same information still present. OK. I left one big question open. And um, maybe this is a point where we could do the break uh, before we do the construction algorithm. Um, I'm a little conscious of time, so uh, I'm inclined to skip the break, actually. I'd rather show the construction slightly slower. Uh, if you feel strongly about this, uh, maybe let me know in the back channel if you feel we need the break. Otherwise, I would continue. I've explained to you now what the LCP array is and why it seems like the right definition to augment the suffix array to get the same functionality as the suffix tree. What I haven't told you so far is how to compute the LCP array. As always, first think about the, the naive and simple way to do it. It's longest common prefixes, so you can always compute this by uh, step by step, each pair individually. But just looking at the two suffixes and comparing them left to right, how many characters match. But obviously that can be, um, that can go for a long while if they share a lot of suffix, if they share a long common prefix. So the overall time could be quadratic and that's uh, out of the question. That's way too slow for anything interesting. Um, but the, the key insight how to do it faster is, is this one. Uh, suppose we do see a very large LCP value and that's one that is costly. If all the LCP values are small, then um, the naive method would work fine. The, it only runs into problems if there are many long shared uh, prefixes. So suppose there is a costly LCP value. That means we can also find another one. And let me show that on this example. Uh, a valid example of an English sentence. You can actually add three more buffaloes. So it's buffalo, 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 buffalo. Uh, a nice coincidence that uh, buffalo is a noun and a verb at the same time. Uh, well, you can read about this. You can go up to seven buffaloes, but that's uh, not my point for today. It's just a nice example with a lot of repetition. If you look at the the suffix array of this text, uh, I know I've shown the the first few suffixes here. Um, then you see that they have a lot of things in common. For example, the the second and third, or well, at position two and three, they share this long allo, buffalo, buffalo. OK. Um, if we chop off the first character of those two suffixes, we get another suffix, obviously. It's not so clear where in the sorted list it is, but it's clearly the suffix that starts one character later. So if we have the suffix array and the inverse suffix array, we can uh, find where they are. And uh, just by definition, if these two share this suff uh, this uh, long common prefix. If I take off the first character on both, they still share the same common prefix except for the first character that's gone. So if the LCP entry here was 19, I'm now sharing um, a prefix of length 18. And I don't have to spend a single comparison to know that. It's by definition, it has to be like that. Uh, there's only one issue here. It's, it's not so clear which LCP value that is and things get worse, it's not even clear if these two suffixes are adjacent in the sorted order, right? It's, you're taking a character away, so that mean it might mean there's more suffixes um, between those. Uh, in general, that can happen. And if that happens, there is no LCP array entry where we would get the value of 18. So it seems like this is this is a good idea because it allows us to save effort. We can, if we once had to find this long common prefix, we would like to uh, exploit that fact for other values and amortize the cost. Uh, but it doesn't seem to work quite exactly by doing that. 
But there is a way to do it, and that's uh, Kasai et al.'s algorithm. Uh, so they found a very, very nice, simple algorithm to do this, and I want to illustrate it just on an example. Uh, the key idea is we don't compute the LCP values in the order of the array, starting with LCP of, zero, of 1, then LCP of 2, etc. That, that seems not easy to do efficiently. Instead, we compute the LCP values in text order. So we start with the longest suffix and then work our way through the string. I'll show you the example. And uh, we use the observation from, from the buffalo example. If we take, if we have a long shared prefix and we take the first character off, that shared prefix will not vanish. We don't know if, there, if the resulting suffixes are still adjacent, but even if they're not, they might be further apart, but then there is another LCP value between those, and that value must be at least as big as uh, the previous one minus one. I think this will become much clearer in the example, so let's just uh, get cracking with that. We start with the first suffix in the text order. That's the entire text. So we start with i equals zero. Uh, here's the entire text. Now, uh, the first thing we do is we find the corresponding LCP value. And for that, we have to move to the right. So we look into uh, the rank array and we find the same string at position six in the sorted list. Remember the LCP values, they sit between the uh, adjacent suffixes in the sorted order. So the LCP value for six is actually talking about this suffix and the one that precedes it in sorted order, and that happens to be ban in this case. And we know which suffix that is because we can go to rank six minus one and then use the uh, suffix array to know where the starting point for that suffix is. But the, uh, what we do in this example here, you, you just directly see this, so just uh, imagine you have written down the, the sorted list by uh, explicitly. What we do now is find longest common prefix of these two suffixes, and we do that in the naive way. So we just uh, compare, we find this is it. They share this long, uh, this um, common prefix of three characters. So the LCP entry for this is three. That was just the naive way to find this common prefix. Now we want to take that knowledge and uh, learn as much from it as possible for other LCP values. And remember, uh, the idea was to chop off the first character. So what we do is, uh, if we chop off the first character, we know there's still this N that is uh, matched. And uh, Kasai's algorithm now says, okay, uh, you just go to the next suffix in text order that corresponds to chopping off one, uh, the first character. You find that char you find where that is in the sorted list using the rank array. So you go to the right and you find this is this is the corresponding suffix that has the first character omitted. And there's one preceding it. Now uh, notice that this one maps to this if you take off the first character, and this one maps to this if we take the first character off. So this is an example where the two are not adjacent in sorted order. There is something in between. But we can still make use of our knowledge about this common prefix because we know an must be shared. It was actually shared between all these, between this and this, but because they are in sorted order, it must be also shared by everything in between. Potentially more, like in this example, we can see here that we can extend this shared prefix by another character. That was not implied by the previous, um, the previous LCP value. We only knew that an doesn't have to be compared again. They have to be the same. We don't have to check them again, but we potentially have to extend that match. And that's what we did here. So we spent one extra comparison and found another LCP array entry of, of uh, three. Okay. That's how this algorithm works. Uh, let's see how it continues. What we've learned from this for the next example is there's a, a shared uh, common prefix of NA. 
we go to the next entry in, in text order, find where it is in the sorted order. We've learned from before that NA is shared, but we have to con compare the next characters. In this case, they don't match. So the LCP array is, the entry is two because they just share this, this inherited common prefix. We remember that there was one shared if we take the first character off. Now, if we find the next, the next suffix in text order in the sorted list, we know that they have this A in common because these are, well, again, um, this is, this one becomes this suffix if I take the first character off. The nair ban actually becomes the A ban, so there's more they share, uh, but this definitely also has an A in the first position. That's what we know. Uh, there's another character that we can match. This we find by just naive comparisons. And uh, that's it. Then they, then they differ. So the LCP entry at this position is a 2. So you see how this goes. Uh, we compute the LCP values in text order, but what that means for the LCP array is that they were filled in some seemingly random order. The important point will be that we can uh, make use of previous comparisons to avoid uh, spending more on the next step. Uh, let's briefly finish this off. Um, the next in text order is, is this one. We find it here. We actually know that the n has uh, to match from previous, from the last entry, but then that's it. So we have an entry one in the LCP array. For the next one, we find it here. Uh, because the previous entry was only the first character, once we take that off, there's nothing left. So we know uh, nothing about those two. And if we compare them, we find that there is indeed nothing that they share. So the entry is zero. And uh, as the strings get shorter, this is a typical phenomenon. If we find this one here, they again share nothing. Um, and uh, we, we again don't know any common prefix for the next round. Um, finding this one here, we find that it at least shares one uh, character at the beginning. That's by naive comparison. And uh, the last one is again a zero because uh, these don't share anything. And uh, notice that we never have to look at the last suffix because that's only the dollar sign. And we know the dollar sign is not shared with anything. And also it's the, the first entry in the list. So there wouldn't be anything that uh, precedes it to compare with. That's Kasai's algorithm by example. Here is the same thing written in code. Um, I probably don't want to spend too much time on this, um, but just how, how does it work? L stores the current length of the uh, common prefix that we found. Initially, that's zero. Then we start with the first position in the text. We find, so uh, we start, uh, I want to do this in black. So we look at, that's not black. We now look at the suffix starting at position i. We find its rank in the sorted list that's moving from the left to the right. That's R. So what we will do is we compute the entry LCP of R. And uh, we'll note that this R can never be zero. That would mean we've reached the, uh, the end of the text, just the, the dollar. And uh, we stop here at n minus one. We never let it reach the last because there's no LCP entry for that to compute anyways. Now this uh, I minus one, Maybe a bit weird of a notation, but that just is the starting index of the suffix that precedes this thing on the right. So uh, if, if this would have been my r, then i minus 1 would be 0 because the suffix that precedes it in sorted order, l of r minus 1 is 0. That's the starting index here for banana ban. Uh, that's exactly that. And then here we do the actual character comparisons and notice that, so we, st we compare the suffix ti and the suffix ti minus uh, one, but we 
start comparing at the elf position of those suffixes because we already inherited a, a potentially a shared common prefix of length elf. Initially that's zero, but uh, when the algorithm keeps going, L can have a larger value in, in the time. That's, that was the, the green characters in my example. So as long as we find matching characters, we increment L. As soon as this terminates, L is the actual length of the shared uh, prefix of these two. So we store that in the appropriate position. And then for preparing the next round, we subtract one from L, but we never go below zero. That is um, taking the first character off the share prefix and then continue. So in code, this is really, really short and concise. Uh, to understand why this is correct, why this computes correctly the LCP arrays, I think the example is much more insightful. Um, but the code is useful to have to implement it and to analyze it. That's what we still have to do. Um, the Overall running time is linear as I as I sketched, but I want to uh, give you a very nice little intuitive argument why that is the case. Uh, what we'll count is the number of character comparisons as most of the time in the string chapter. And the key insight here is uh, these character comparisons, they only happen at this at this single position, right? So this is counting how often we have to iterate this inner loop. And the key insight is we have to separately count those that come out equal and those that come out unequal, then we can easily bound their total number. Whenever one of these is unequal, that means we leave the internal, the inner loop, and we only do that once for each iteration of the outer loop, right? For every i, we enter this loop, repeat that a couple of times, but then eventually we leave it when the characters are unequal. So we do that exactly as many times as the outer loop is, uh, is run. So it's at most n uh, comparisons from, from there. So these are, these are fine. These are linear in number. The equal comparisons are a little more concerning because uh, for each individual iteration, we could spend a long time running our circles in this inner loop. Uh, but uh, we can again do a, a potential style argument. Um, this L value always increases by one in the loop, but uh, it's only decremented n times in total because it's only decremented here and that's only run once per iteration, so only n times in total. And uh, we also know that L can never be uh, bigger than N because that would be the entire length of the string. So you can only walk up with L a certain number of times. You can never walk down more than N times and it stays below N. That works out to at most uh, two N increments um, in, in, the in the worst case. So uh, both operations are overall limited by uh, a constant times n. So Kasai's algorithm runs in linear time, uh, even though it's based on the naive version of just comparing uh, the characters uh, from left to right, but by exploiting the fact that um, a long shared prefix of, of two suffixes implies another shared uh, prefix of two other suffixes, uh, we can get the overall running time to linear. Okay. With that, we can um, go back to suffix trees. So we found a way to construct suffix arrays. We found a way to construct LCP arrays. And these two things actually encode all the information in the suffix tree. That's what I've shown in this picture before. So a way to get a reasonable practical algorithm for suffix trees is to compute the suffix array, compute the LCP array, and then construct the tree from those two. You will actually look at this um, construction on an example in the tutorials, so I don't want to uh, talk about this in detail in class. Um, but uh, once you have these two things uh, and uh, observe this connection, 
it's actually not too hard uh, to really construct the suffix tree if you wanted. And that is finally looking into this magic box. Remember initially before Easter when we started this, this uh, text in the indexing chapter, I told you there is this magic data structure, the suffix tree, famous people conjectured uh, that it doesn't exist because it, it solved problems that they thought are not solvable in linear time. And yet it does exist and it's constructible in linear time, but it's complicated and I don't tell you how yet. But here you actually learned how, you actually, uh, you've actually seen um, how to do this um, in most of the details. And uh, I think that's a, that's a good, a good starting, a stopping point for this uh, unit. Concluding this, this uh, section and, and actually the entire unit a little earlier than I thought, um, the enhanced suffix array, that usually means the suffix array plus x, where x is the LCP array, sometimes plus additional things. Again, I'll refer you to the tutorials for one example, what this other x could be. But uh, usually based on the suffix array and the LCP array, you get a simple data structure that's, um, that's easy to handle in code and that can support um, the same algorithm as suffix trees without using complicated ways to represent the tree efficiently. So these are really the modern version of suffix trees. Unfortunately, not as widely spread in, in uh, textbooks yet, but I think this is just because the suffix arrays and all these algorithms, they're all from this millennium, they're all past 2000. This is fairly recent stuff given, given that this is such a, a fundamental problem. It just took people uh, time to, to figure out these connections. So in, in their raw form, it can be a bit harder to reason about these enhanced suffix arrays as opposed to the trees. But the way that people use these is you think of an algorithm to solve a problem on suffix trees, and then you find a way to simulate what you need in the tree based on the arrays. And uh, usually that works out fine. I haven't seen an example where it didn't eventually where someone didn't even, well, not eventually someone invented a way to implement it based on, on the arrays. It uses much less, less space. Both are linear. Uh, so this is an example where the theta notation um, is, not, is a bit um, misleading. Both have theta of n space in theory, but the constant factors uh, do matter here. And uh, you've actually seen a linear time construction for this. Um, with that, I want to conclude uh, Unit 6. And I also want to conclude today's session. It doesn't make sense to start the new, uh, entirely new topic in the last 10 minutes. Um, I, I was somehow under the impression that I would have much less time. So we could have well done the uh, 10 minute break um, before the construction. I hope I didn't over go overly fast which uh, just means you have some extra time for doing whatever you want. Um, uh, I'll be here if you want for some time on uh, Zoom for discussing whatever you feel. Um, and of course, if you have questions about today, I'm also happy to answer uh, some more questions either on the Q&A or on Zoom than in the smaller, in the smaller group. All right, uh, don't forget about the tutorials 4 p.m. today. Don't forget about the class tests due on Friday. I'll have fun watching your videos. Don't expect feedback too soon. This week is fairly full with all sorts of things, unfortunately, but uh, I, I will eventually come back to these. And uh, see you again um, uh, the next Tuesday, 11 a.m. as always, or in a few minutes on Zoom. Bye for now.